Church. My name is Johnny, and I am a Johnson University student. I'm also interning this semester here at a church called Home. This week, we will be hosting our first Wednesday night of prayer. Whether you're facing an impossible situation or simply desiring a deeper relationship with Christ, our night of prayer is designed to meet those needs. This is a powerful one-hour block of time that begins this Wednesday at 7 p.m. We hope to see you there. What's up, everyone? Mariah here, and Halloween is just around the corner. If you are looking for a fun, safe place for your kids to get some candy, this is it. On Saturday, October 30th, from 4 to 6 p.m., we will be hosting our annual Trunk or Treat. This is going to be so much fun for the kids. We will be giving away over 1,000 pounds of candy. We will also have inflatables and free hot dogs, so you do not want to miss this. Now you might be asking, what is Trunk or Treat? Families from our church decorate their vehicle, fill their trunk with candy, and come set up here at the church. Hundreds of kids from the community trick or treat from car to car. It's a blast! If you would like to host a vehicle or serve on our team that night, register by texting Welcome Home to 94000. You can also visit acch.us slash trunk or treat. And for the next few weeks, we will be collecting candy for this event. You can drop your candy off in the cafe in the Love Thy Neighbor bin. Well, that's all for now, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the service. Good morning uh, to everyone here that's in the house with us today, and also good morning to everyone watching and joining us online. Would you guys give it up for the people watching? So uh, this morning we are continuing our sermon series on vision and what God-centered vision looks like and how we can apply this to our lives. And so Pastor Jason and I were talking earlier, and, and he liked the idea of me coming and sharing part of my testimony with you all uh, this morning. And so that's what we're going to do. Um, but before we're, we dive right into it, um, I just want to say a word of prayer. So will you pray with me? Father God, thank you so much for this church family uh, that I get to call my family uh, for the next couple months. Thank you for the way that they have poured into me. And, and I ask that I can pour into them this morning, Father. And bless the words uh, that, that you've prepared me to give, and um, I just ask that everyone in this room, everyone I'm in the cafe, everyone watching online, is in a better place in their relationship with you and your son um, after this message and after this morning um, than where we were when it began. And it's all those things I want to ask in your holy name, amen. amen. So I was raised in Iowa, and I lived a pretty normal life. Well, pretty normal as far as uh, normal goes for a pastor's kid. Um, I know a lot of you can probably relate uh, to that. As a pastor's kid, I was always in the church from the start of our first service to the end of our last service. I was always in the building on Sunday night, Wednesday night, every camp, every retreat, every youth group. You get the gist. If the church doors were unlocked, I was probably there doing something. And that being said, um, a lot of pastor's kids sort of get tired of the whole church thing the longer that they get dragged into church. Um, but fortunately, my three sisters and I, we never really got tired of the whole church thing. We viewed our church as, a, as kind of an extension of our family, and we fell in love with, with uh, the way things worked, and, and, and we just loved being a part of our community and our church. And so as I, as I got older and I start to envision what my future would look like, I, start, I started to feel God calling me to do something similar to what my dad did. And, and the vision that God gave me was to also be a part of the church and vocational ministry. And so I remember I was going through high school, and, and this wasn't an overnight thing that God had planted in my brain, but, but things that happened over the course of time where, where I kind of knew and I was kind of set uh, that going in and working into the church and uh, doing ministry was what I wanted to do. So that being said, after, after I knew that was my vision, that was my goal, that's what I wanted to do with my life, I started looking for colleges that, that I could study ministry, and I found a college called Cincinnati Christian University, 
in Cincinnati, Ohio, and so that's where I spent my, my, spent my first year of school there. And knowing that I would need to do an internship at some point in my college for, for credit in order to graduate, um, and knowing I wasn't going to be able to do my official you know, full-scale internship until later on in my college career, um, I talked with my dad, and we both thought that it would be a really good idea for me uh, to go back home and to be my dad's intern for that first summer after my freshman year of college. And I might be a little bit biased when I say this, but my dad is the best minister ever. <laughs> and uh, I say that for a lot of reasons. Uh, first of all, as far as a, a preacher goes, he always leaves people on the edge of their seat, leaning in, wanting to listen, and wanting to apply the words that he was saying to the congregation and bring those out to their everyday life. As far as leadership goes, um, he's the best leader. He knows what to do in every situation, and he never hesitates to do what is right. And as far as his walk with the Lord, um, I always envy his compassion, his love, and his faith that he has for the church. And so God placed a vision on his heart um, before my first birthday to uh, start and, and help, help grow a church in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And at the time of my internship, my dad had taken that church, which was running about 150 people in one service, um, to having four services and about roughly 2,000 people in attendance every weekend. And, and we had acquired grounds for our new building that was set to launch in a few months. And so everything was looking up. And his vision this, that God had given him to, to create a church of God-fearing and God-loving people in our community of Cedar Rapids, Iowa, was coming true. And, and I wanted to have and be a part of a vision just like that. And so that summer, I went back home, and after, after school, I packed up all my bags, and, and I headed back to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, to be my dad's intern for the summer. And so the first week of our internship, he had the week off. And so who starts an internship when, the, when your boss is, is not even there? I don't know, but that's what we did. And so I was in the office for the first week. He gave me a handful of books to start reading, and so I read through those, made some notes over them. And the following week was when he was finally in the office, and I was finally going to get to learn what he did for all the hours that he was in the office, um, because little did I know at the time, you know, he's not just writing a sermon and then preaching it on Sunday morning and for the rest of the time twiddling his thumbs. And Pastor Jason doesn't do that either, um, as I know, most of you all know. So I was finally going to be able to see and be a part of this process, except this week was a little bit different. I remember it. It was actually a Thursday morning. I had woken up, and I was, I was still running competitively, competitively cross-country and track for my college. And, and so I, I got up early in the morning. I, I got to my high school at 7.30, actually. There were some guys who I had graduated with who were still running competitively as well, so we were training together throughout the summer. And we left, we left our school that morning. We were going for a run, and as we got back, I had a, you know, a Garmin, a GPS running watch. And when my running watch had finally reconnected with my phone that I had left in my car, it started buzzing like crazy. And, you know, you try to read the messages when they're all popping up at the same time, but you can't really read anything. But I'll never forget the last message that popped up on my watch screen. And it said, he's not breathing. And at the time, I didn't, I didn't know what that meant. I was confused. And so I looked around at the guys. I'm like, I don't really know what's going on, but I think I need to leave. And they're like... Yeah, you should probably go. So I got back to my car, I checked my phone, and I had missed calls, missed texts from just about every one of my family members. And I realized something was happening with my dad, but they didn't know what was going on, I didn't know what was going on. So I got in my car, I drove back to my house, and I remember for the first time just praying to God, like, please, please help this, help this not be what I think it is. Please help this not be what I think it is. So when I got back to my house, I met with my oldest sister, who was there at the time. She didn't know much more than I knew, and, and so she got in my car, and we drove to the hospital, and my sister, who was in, living in Missouri at the time, had called us to see if we knew any more information, had any idea what was going on, but, but none, of us, none of us did, and so we're, we're on our way to the hospital, and, and when my older sister and I get there, um, we get out of our car, we're, we're crossing the street to, to enter the building, and an ambulance drove in front of us. Um, but its lights weren't flashing. It wasn't in a hurry. And I just had this, I just had this feeling in my core that, that that was him. 
So we got, we got into the hospital, and my, we finally meet up with my mom. She's hysterical, kind of going crazy, and she gives me a list of family members to start calling. She says, hey, tell them what's going on. Ask, ask them to pray. <laughs> We're going to get as many people to pray for this situation as we can. So that's exactly what I did, start calling family members. Hey, I don't know what's going on, but it's bad. It's not looking good. After a few minutes of sitting there in the lobby, they ushered us back into the family waiting room, and we were there for probably no longer than, than 10, 15 minutes, and I still have this image in my brain. Sorry. Of two doctors holding a stack of papers. telling me that he didn't make it to the hospital. And that's a moment I'm never going to forget. And I'm not going to forget that moment for a lot of reasons. First of all, the vision that I had of what my family was going to look like was forever changed. I mean, he wasn't going to be there every day. He wasn't in the picture anymore. And so... (laughs) This vision I had of my family was gone. Not only that, but the vision I had of, of him being a mentor in my life, that was gone too. You know, having him by my side throughout my college years, helping me find a job, you know, starting me in the church and, and pouring into me all the things that, that I knew he would, that wasn't going to happen anymore. And I didn't know where to turn. But not only that, this summer that I had with him was gone before, before it ever really started. And I never got the opportunity to see what he did and, and be a pastor like him. And so I find myself sitting in this hospital room, and, and I don't know where my vision went. And all of a sudden, there's this giant mountain of an obstacle between this vision that I thought was supposed to be for good, and I, I didn't know why God would have placed this obstacle in my path. And so I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, is this really the right vision that I had? Is this what you wanted me to do with my life? And so that being said, uh, that leads us into what we're going to talk about this morning. And I have a question for each and every one of you all. Has God ever given you a vision? Has God ever given you a vision that he wanted you to do in your life? that has been crushed by unforeseen circumstances. You know, I would, I would go to say that probably most of us in this room have had a plan of what God wants them to do in their life, and all of a sudden, this giant, uh, this giant boulder gets dropped on top of that vision, and, and they can't see a way to get around it, and they don't know what to do. Maybe your vision was to provide for your family, and, and ever since COVID happened and you've been laid off, of your job. You, you got a new job, but it's, it's just not the same. And you don't know how you're going to continue to, to go to work every day and provide for your family, given that everything in our, in our world seems to be inconsistent. Or maybe your vision is to create a God-fearing family, uh, a vision in which um, has been crushed by, by arguing and fighting, possibly divorce, a death, or, or maybe even your, your children have grown up and they've, and they've walked away from the Lord and you don't know how that could have happened. Maybe your vision this morning is to just get closer to God, but you can't seem to find time in your schedule to fit Him in and really see where He's trying to lead you in your life. I would say that, that most of us in here are facing an obstacle in front of our vision and our life. And so the question is, what are we going to do when that happens? Well, I believe that the answer to this question can be found no further than looking in the Word. And so this morning we are going to look at a very familiar story about a man who was given a vision and obstacle after obstacle was taken and put in his place. And so that being said, um, Genesis 37 begins with the very familiar story of a young boy of a young boy with the name of Joseph. And Joseph was one of 12 sons born to his father Jacob. But Joseph was special because he was Jacob's firstborn son to his favorite wife. And so that being said, he was always, (laughs) 
he was always favored by his father, so much so that his father even one time gave him, gave him a special cloak to show that he was set apart from the rest of his brothers. And if you have experienced any sort of uh, favoritism in your own family, or maybe you've got to watch it happen to one of your younger siblings, uh, for me, that's my little sister, you might know a little bit about what this feels like. But yet, Joseph was still given dreams and visions by God. And he knew that these visions were from God. And what these visions were, they were all telling him that at one point in his life, his family is going to bow down to him. And he didn't know what that meant. He didn't know what that meant at the time, but he did know that it was going to happen because it was given to him by God. With that being said, the, the jealousy and envy of his brother still continued uh, to grow. And so we read in Genesis, Genesis 37, verses 23 through 24, it says, When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they threw him into a cistern. The cistern was empty, and there was no water in it. So they got to a point where they were so jealous and so envious and so bitter that they decided to kill their brother because they would rather have him dead than have to go another day with him talking about his dreams and his visions that they've had. Um, but then they actually changed their mind. They thought of a better idea, because why kill your brother when you can sell him into slavery and make a little bit of money? <laughs> so the next thing we read in Genesis 37, verse 27, it says, So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brother pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him out to Egypt. So after selling him into slavery, his brothers dip his coat in blood and take it back to his father uh, so that they can frame this death and this disappearance of his son on someone other than themselves rather than taking ownership for that. And, it said, and the Bible tells us that meanwhile, in Genesis 37, 36, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of the Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. So one day, Joseph was having visions of his family and his brothers and his parents bowing down to him, and the next, he sold into slavery in a different country. Talk about obstacles. I would say that being sold into slavery completely away from your family is, is a little bit, maybe more than a little bit, of an obstacle to Joseph's vision. But yet, where is God in the midst of this? We read in, in Genesis 39 two, it says, The Lord was with Joseph, so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. So here's the truth this morning. It's that even when Joseph was sold into slavery, even when he was bound and taken all over to another country, God still was with him. While he was forced against his will by his brothers to go in the well, and then to be sold, and now he's in a whole different country, and now he's at a different master's house, God stayed near to him. He might have been the one moving, and it might not even have been his choice, but God stayed the same. And this was evident to Joseph, and it was evident to the people around him as well. We go on to read in Genesis 39.3, it says, His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him, his, him success in everything he did. Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted his care to everything he owned. The Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything, except for the food that he ate. Given the circumstances that Joseph was put into, becoming the head of the household in one of the most powerful households in all of Egypt isn't too bad of a look for him. I mean, he's kind of starting to turn things around for the better. And I would argue that one of the reasons why Joseph was able to turn this thing around is that he stayed true to the vision that God had given him. He reminded himself that this vision wasn't just something that he had that came from elsewhere or his own imagination. No, this vision that he had was given by the Lord. And because of that, he stayed true to this. I mean, he had to be one hard-nosed person to go through what he had gone through, yet still remain faithful 
to the Lord and his promise. You know, he was more convinced that the vision that God had given him was more powerful than anything that the devil could have thrown in his way. So much so that that the Bible tells us that one day, uh, Joseph ultimately became a handsome and well-built young man. And he started to catch the eye of Potiphar's wife. And given Potiphar's position um, in Egypt at the time, Potiphar most likely had his pick of whatever wife he wanted, so she was most likely very good looking. And so she caught the eye of Joseph, and the Bible tells us that, that one day she approached him and said, come to bed with me. Now Joseph was young, but he wasn't dumb. <laughs> and he knew, he knew that if he fell into this trap, uh, that that would be a sin against Potiphar and a sin against God. So he ran from the situation and he said, no, I'm not going to put myself in that situation anymore. But yet she still came after him time and time again. Genesis 39.10 tells us that although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. He refused to even be with her because he knew exactly what would happen or even what it would look like if he was caught in her presence. And so... You know the story. You know what happens. Uh, so if you will, listen, listen to me with what happens, starting in Genesis 39, verse 11. It says, One day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. That just, that just smel- smells like bad news, doesn't it? <laughs> it says that she caught him by the cloak, and she said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. And when he saw that, he, that, she had left his, that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make a sport of us. He came to sleep with me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. And she told him this story, that the Hebrew slave you brought us has come to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard this and his wife, all the things that his wife was saying, he said, this is how your slave has treated me? He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. After years of making all the right choices, after years of being Uh, the bottom of the slaves, and then working his way up in his master's household because of nothing that he could control, because of nothing that he deserved, Joseph once again found himself in the lows of the lows. He was doing all the right things. He was working hard. He was faithful to God. He even ran away from temptation. But yet now he's facing another mountain of an obstacle in his way. And I can't help but think that there's probably a little piece of him that's thinking, where is God? Why why would you do this to me, God? And I would probably say that many of us in this room have asked God those same questions ourselves. I know that when, when my father passed away, I had a lot of questions like that. But yet this story is still clear. As we read in Genesis 39, 20, through 21, says, But while Joseph was in there, in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. If you are ever questioning where God is in the midst of the obstacles to your vision, look no further than the prison where Joseph was thrown and remind yourself that the Lord was there too. And while facing another obstacle, uh, you know, similarly to the way that he worked himself up while he was sold into slavery, Joseph remained faithful to the Lord, and the Lord blessed him because of this. And as we go on to read in the story, Joseph became friends with the prison warden, and now all of a sudden he's, he's in charge of the prison as well, just like he was in charge of Potiphar's household. And the Lord has given him opportunities to prove himself and to show how close he really is with God. And the way he does this is by interpreting visions and dreams 
very similar to the one he had so many years back for fellow prisoners. And then later word gets out, um, after years of Joseph interpreting these visions and dreams, um, to Pharaoh, who himself had a vision and a dream that he needed interpreted. And so after no one in the entire land could interpret this dream for Pharaoh, he, he sends out word, find me someone who can. And his, uh, his cupbearer at the time remembered when he was in prison and Joseph interpreted his dream. So he had Pharaoh call Joseph up. So Pharaoh tells him his dream. He tells him all the visions that he's been having and Joseph tells him exactly what is going to happen. What Joseph tells him is that there's going to be seven years of fortune followed by seven years of famine. And in order for them to be prepared for the famine, they need to store up their grain houses um, during the seven years of prosperity so that they're prepared. And after hearing this, Pharaoh thinks that that's probably a good idea too. But who's going to be in charge of this great plan? Joseph, (laughs) right? (laughs) Who else? And so Pharaoh takes him out from the prison and he puts him in charge and he makes him second command in all of Israel. And in Genesis 41 verse 38, we even read, So Pharaoh asked them, Can we find anyone like this man in whom is the Spirit of God? I mean, it was even obvious to Pharaoh and Egyptians who served a completely different set of false gods that the God of the Bible, the God of Joseph, was real and his spirit was living in him, despite his obstacles. And so I'm sure that you guessed it, everything that Pharaoh had visioned and had dreams about came true. Everything that Joseph told him was going to happen, happened. And everything that God had showed Joseph would happen, was going to happen. Everything that Joseph had gone through, these years of pain, these years of confusion, years of slavery, years of sitting in a prison, was all leading up to this one moment. And God put Joseph in a position where he was actually able to save countless people because of the food that he had stored up. But what about that initial vision that he had given Joseph? Did that come true as well? Well, actually, uh, the land of Canaan wasn't an exception to this famine as well. And that's where Joseph was from. And so, the same ten brothers that had thrown him into the well and then sold him into slavery, at this point, probably more than 25 years ago, make their way to Egypt where they hear that there's food stored up. And we read in Genesis 42, 6, it says, Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all of its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces at the ground. This is the moment in which Joseph's visions actually become a reality. And the only reason that they were able to become a reality is because God never left Joseph. It didn't matter where Joseph was, God remained faithful to him. And Joseph remained faithful to God. So that all of these years of toil and labor and hard work and thinking and asking God, where are you? had all led to this moment in the story of Joseph to where his initial vision had become a reality. That initial vision that God had given him he had blessed Joseph with. And seeing in this text multiple times the reminder that how bad things got for Joseph, God was still with him, is the reminder that we need this morning in order to face our obstacles with confidence and know that God will pull through for us. Because the same God who was watching over Joseph and was with Joseph is the same God that is still watching over and is with us today. So you may be asking yourself, so what happened with you and your obstacle? And as you probably could have guessed, uh, I'm here today, I'm interning at a church, I'm about to graduate in December and go into ministry, and I still believe that this vision that God has given me to work in the church um, is where I should be. And I know that God has never left me. Yeah. 
I would be lying if I didn't say that there were certain times in my life and my story that, that I didn't question where God was. But ultimately, all along, I can look back and I can see the way that his hand was over my situation. And, and so I'm praying that this morning, if you are facing an obstacle, uh, remember that the Lord is with you. He, he has never left. Uh, this obstacle may not be from him, but if your vision is truly the vision that he has given you, um, it will come true, and he will see to it that it does. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's online service. Thank you for joining us. Listen, before we go, if you don't know Jesus, if you're away from God, I'd love to pray with you right where you are. You know, maybe today when you were younger, you were connected to a church, to, to Christ. Uh, you were a part of the faith, but something's happened over the years, and and you just need to reconnect. Listen, I'd love to pray with you right where you are. Would you pray with me? Come on, just open your mouth and repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I need you in my life. I open my heart to you. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to wash me. I ask you to cleanse me inside and out. God, be at the center of my life. I give you my heart today. Today I make a new start. In Jesus' name, come on, say amen. Listen, if you prayed with me, I believe what the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I've got a gift that I want to give you. I, I wrote a couple years ago a new book called Making a New Start. That's what you've done today. It's a simple read. It's a small devotion. You can read it in just an afternoon. But I, I promise you, it will be a blessing to you as you make that new start with Christ today. So do me a favor. Text the words, Welcome Home, to the number 94000. 94000. Welcome Home to 94000. Click You Gave Your Heart to Christ and we'll send you a free copy of that devotion, Making a New Start. So thank you so much for joining us today. Can't wait to see you next week. God bless.